All right, as you know, we're st we are, of course, are still in Acts, and we're in, we're in Acts 20, for those of you who have your Bibles with you today. And if you remember last time, we saw Paul and these seven companions that were traveling with him. They were moving, if you remember, they were moving back overland. They were backtracking their steps through, and they were going through Berea. You can see it on this map I've just passed out. They were going back through Berea. They were going back through Thessalonica and then on to Philippi, okay? Paul originally had planned to sail from the Corinth area. Actually, he was going to, he was going to probably go out of the port of Sencrea, but he was, at, he was going from the Corinth area, and he was going to sail back to Syria, okay? But because he had heard about a plot that, the, that had formed against them by some of the Jews, they decided not to sail. We don't know why, but that was, that's what that was written in Scripture. And he decided then to walk back overland. And once they got back to Philippi, Paul sent these men on ahead of him because um, he wanted to stay. Paul wanted to stay and celebrate Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread in Philippi with his brothers and sisters. Paul still celebrated all the, I'm, I'm sure Paul still celebrated, like most of them, still celebrated the Jewish feasts. But his traveling companions, if you remember, were Gentiles. And they had no reason to stay and celebrate Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So he tells them to go on ahead. And they, they, they take the, the ship over to Troas. Um, Philippi was a very special place for Paul. So I think that's why he wanted to stay there and celebrate with them. Well, after the days of the feast, Paul sailed from Philippi um, to Troas. And there, on the first day of the week, the Christian church gathered together and served the Lord's Supper as well as hearing Paul teach. And let's, that's where we were last week when, when, we, when, we, when we finished up, I think. So let's read Acts 20, verses 7 and 8. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. Yeah, that's where we were. That's pretty much where, where we were last time. Um, the people were meeting in the upper room and during the evening. And their service was prob probably started, if you remember, probably just after dusk. Okay? Churches in those days met in the homes of believers. Homes large enough to fit everyone. But you can imagine that this was probably a very tight fit because Paul was here preaching and they all wanted to hear Paul. And it wasn't, you know, as I said last time, it wasn't until the middle of the second century that the Christians began building their own um, churches. So they still are meeting in homes. So last time, this is just following up with what we talked about last time. We've now seen when the churches met. They were meeting at night. We saw where they're meeting. And now, looks, now let's look at what they were doing. If you remember, what, the, what we saw in verse 7 is they, were, they told us they were breaking bread together. Well, Jesus had told them, obviously, in the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me. Um, and this seems to be the primary purpose of why they were meeting. The Lord's Supper, of course, we know that. It's a memorial, a memorial of the death of Jesus Christ, his body, his body given and his blood shed for us. And we still do the Lord's Supper today, and we always should, because Jesus told us to do it. And it's interesting because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The do this is in the Greek present tense. And what the Greek present tense actually says, keep on doing this. It's not just do it today. Keep on doing this. And it's also spoken in the imperative, which is a command. So Jesus is commanding us to keep on doing this as often as you shall eat in remembrance of me. So the church met to observe the Lord's Supper, and they probably did that weekly. But, but there was also, as they had had in the synagogue, they, they were preaching of the word. And that's what it says in verse 7 there. It said um, that Luke, or I meant Luke, but Paul began talking to them, okay? And the word talking is that Greek word we've heard a lot in Acts. It's dialegami, okay? And dialegami, we've seen this often. And this was Paul's method of communicating the gospel message. 
by dialoguing with the people. Questions were thrown out, questions were answered. This allowed people to think about what Paul was saying and, um, and what he was telling them, okay? Paul didn't just go out there and preach. Paul allowed questions. He allowed dialoguing. And I never thought about that until I started studying, but he allowed questions and dialoguing because people didn't, uh, might not have understood what he was talking about. And they, I mean, we all have questions. Wouldn't you love to just ask the pastor, you know? But if we did that, that would take, take away from his sermon totally. But I mean, that's what they were doing. They were asking questions because they didn't understand everything. And it was great that they were doing that. Well, scripture tells us that Paul had intended on leaving the next day, but he prolonged his message. He extended his message until midnight. So Paul preached until midnight. So when do you think he started? When do you think normally they would start their service? Sunday. Yeah, probably six o'clock, probably sundown, because um, this didn't, it didn't start at 11 o'clock like we start our services, you know, but it probably started at sundown. And so Paul's still been dialoguing with these people for what? It's because this is probably about April. So it's probably been dialoguing with them for about four hours now. Okay. And um, many of the early, ch but it, something we also need to understand, many of the early church members were servants. Okay. And they had very little free time. They could only come at night and after, after their chores had been finished, and they probably had to, had to go back and get up early to do the chores that were necessary for them to do. But in, and then in verse 8, we see here that Luke tells us that there were many lamps in the upper room, okay? Think of, these are not electric lamps, obviously. Think of the fumes that came off of these many lamps. The, you know, you had, you, had the, you had these oil lamps in the upper room, People were stuffed together, listening to, listening to the Apostle Paul teach. And with all these lamps and with all these fumes and the smoke and whatever, and with all these people, um, I would think the oxygen in the room was probably depleted quite a bit. Well, let's see what happens because of this in verse 9. There was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. Yep, I meant to tell you his name is Eutychus, okay? Yep. But yeah, so here, here, here we've got this young man, probably a teenager, okay? And, and his name is Eutychus, and he's sitting by the window, okay? Probably the best place for a teenager to be because, you know, who knows how interested he is? We, don't, we really don't know because it was getting late, Okay? And he's there, and all these fumes, and all the people, he's fighting sleep. Uh, Y'all have never fought sleep in church, have you? <laughs> yeah, Tom. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you're talking about falling asleep during a sermon, but he's talking about Paul spoke on and on. He did, he yep. a young man, and he was sitting by the window. You, you can just imagine any of us. Yeah, and, and I. He was really smart because he was getting some air. Because uh, you know, he, you know, he was there to get to get the air. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine he was there to get the air. But he, he's a teenager, you know. And I mean, I'm not a teenager. And sorry, Sean, I may fall asleep. You know, I try not to. But you know, we all fight it from time to time. Okay. So, so here you've got this. So here you've got this teenager fighting drowsiness, okay? He, he's trying to listen. He's trying to understand what Paul is saying, and he's probably having trouble understanding all that Paul is communicating and the questions that are being thrown out at him. But he finally falls asleep, and he falls back out of the third-story window, and he died, okay? Now, who wrote this? Who wrote, who's writing Acts? Luke. And what is Luke's profession? He's a doctor. So here we've got a doctor, and Dr. Luke writes that Eutychus was picked up dead, okay? I think the doctor knows dead, all right? And, and I'm guessing there was nothing that he could do. He must have broke his neck or whatever. We don't know, but he fell down and, and was dead. Um, but then Paul, I'm sure being led by the Holy Spirit, went downstairs to help. So let's read verse 10. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. Yeah, so, so Paul goes down, and he falls upon the young man. <laughs> fell upon is the Greek word epipedo. Epipedo means to embrace, to lie upon, 
to press upon. Paul here is following the example of Elijah. Do you remember when Elijah, when Elijah laid upon, he raised the widow's son? Let's look at that. Let's look at 1 Kings 17, verses 21 and 22. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Yeah, and we know Paul knew this story because he knew the Old Testament, okay? We've all read this story before. And so I guess Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to do the exact same thing. I mean, Dr. Luke could do nothing. I mean, he found this, this poor boy dead. But Paul was led to do exactly what Elijah had done. I'm sure the Holy Spirit told him to do it. And so he lies on him, and he, and, and he says, don't be troubled, for his life is in him. Paul knew that this, this, this young man was not dead, but he was dead. But he was bringing, he's going to bring him back from, to, the, to life. I mean, what a church service, guys. This was amazing. I mean, here they've got the Apostle Paul. How cool was that to be in, in with the Apostle Paul hearing him preach, hearing him teach, and answer questions. And then tragedy strikes. I mean, how awful is that? And then the people are grieving, and then all of a sudden, this young man is brought back to life. I mean, what an amazing service. We're going to jump down to verse 12. Read verse 12 for us. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Yeah, I mean, they took the boy away alive. I mean, and of course they were greatly comforted, but... Interesting here, there's very little said about raising Eutychus from the dead. There's no hype. There's nothing major here. Just they took the boy away alive and were greatly comforted, okay? I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. I mean, Luke really is kind of downplaying this. And I don't think he's downplaying it because he couldn't heal him. Um, I think Luke is telling us that faith is not based on what is seen, but, on, but it's based on the word of God. It's not the amazing miracles that will sustain the church. It's God's word and his Holy Spirit. All right, so let's see what happened after Eutychus' um, resurrection. Let's read verse 11. Who's got that? I do. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he taught with them a long while until daybreak and then left. All right, so the people go right back upstairs, and what do they do? They ate. Yeah, they keep, they ate again, okay? So they are, I believe, that they are, they are observing the Lord's Supper again. Why would they do that? Thanksgiving. Absolutely. I mean, they had just seen this young boy die, and now he's raised to life. I think they're just honoring God for his miracle, and, 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 you know, and, and, and they're just loving, they're loving this because they're seeing some amazing things. And then it says, Paul continues to talk to them about the things of God until dawn. So guys, this, this church service lasted from dusk until dawn, okay? And it was focused on the Lord's Supper and teaching of the Word of God. I mean, what an amazing evening service. Wouldn't you lo he, love to have been there? I kind of figured he broke some bones. He had, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, he might have been in pain. I don't know. It doesn't say, but they took him back upstairs, so he must have been like fully well, ill. Right into the dead. No, no, he. Cure me bones. No, he. I don't. I don't, we, I don't yeah, know. We, we, know, but I'm we don't have any idea. We yeah. we really. It doesn't they say. Took him back up there. Yep. So obviously That's why I figured his neck was broken, but you know, with his life, who knows? Know. But everything's good because he's. Happy, yeah. Yep. So <laughs> so it it is just an amazing story of how. God can use us when we allow him to, right? Well, okay, so after this all-night service, Paul intends to go on with his journey, okay? That's what it said. They, they, and he said he talked with them a little while until break, break, and then left. So Paul intends on keeping on with his, his journey. So let's read the next two verses, 13 and 14. But we, going ahead to the ship, set sail for Assos, intending from there to take Paul on board, for so he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. All right, so the, here, we, here we've got the we here, okay? And the we here are those seven men that had gone on ahead of Paul into Troas and waited for him there, okay? But you also have Luke, because Luke's the one writing this, and he's, again, 
writing in the first person plural. We. He says we. He said we going ahead to the ship. So they're going ahead. To, they're going ahead to the ship, and they're intending to go with to get Paul on board. But Paul decides to walk. Okay? And that's one of the reasons I gave you this map, because our map does not have ASOS on it. Okay? And you can see, if you look at Troas and from to ASOS, it's on the same peninsula, just on opposite sides of that same peninsula. And, if, and what it is, basically, the men sailed of the 40-mile trip from, a, from Troas to ASOS. Uh, but Paul decided to walk. Okay? The hike is about 20 to 25 miles. What's that? I said, I hope there was a bridge. He never would have gotten there. Why? No, he can. Would he? No. Okay. That's an island. Oh, no. They go there afterwards. No, they go. No, they, we're talking about ASOS. Yeah. Just ASOS. From Troas to ASOS, from Troas to ASOS on that point. No, no, no. We're, he's not going to. He's, he's catching the boat in ASOS, but he's walking. And there's nothing in Scripture that I've been able to find. Nobody says anything about what he did when he walked. I, I just believe with everything that's going on, with what just happened the night before, I think Paul needed time with the Lord. You know, Jesus always went off by himself after think big, big things were happening. And I think Paul was just needing time with Christ. I don't know. Maybe he knew people between Troas and Asos. I don't know. But he's got a 25-mile hike. Well, he rested somewhere. I, I, yeah, because, you know, he, he hadn't slept, had he? None of them had really slept. I don't think I'd rather have been on the ship. But, uh, <laughs> but Paul was guided to walk. So, Sometimes you just had enough of your family. So, <laughs> like, Go on, I'll meet you there. So Paul joins them in Asos, and he gets on board the ship, and he joins them as they leave for Middling. So let's read verses 15 and 16. Sailing from there, we arrived the following day opposite Chios, and the next day we crossed over to Samos. And the day following, we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Yeah, so, okay, so we, you can see on the map, if you look at your map here, you can see from he, 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 the places that Paul went from Asos, he sailed on to Mytilene, okay, and, and, they, and from Mytilene, they crossed, then they, then they went from there to Chios, right? Now, Chios, uh, Chios is an island, it's only about four and four point three miles from the coast, but it's a good it's a good distance from from Middling. It's probably about sixty miles from Middling. But um, so he he goes on to Chios and um, and Chios. By the way, something you might not know, Chios is remembered for because the birthplace of Homer. Homer wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad. Well, that's what Chios is known is known for. Um, well, the next day they sail on to Samos or Samos or Samos, and it's also an island. It's about 30 miles southwest of Ephesus, but it's an 80-mile trip from Chios by ship. Okay, and the next day, then they land at Miletus, and that's a shorter trip of about 20 miles. So see, this is just to show you how exactly they pretty much went, okay? And, and Miletus is an ancient city. It's an ancient Greek city in the, on the western coast of Asia Minor near the Meander River, Okay. Now, Paul consciously bypassed Ephesus, and Luke tells us why. Why did he bypass Ephesus? Did anybody see that in there when, when we read it? He didn't want to spend time in Asia because he wanted to make it to Jerusalem for Pentecost. He really was on a schedule, and he felt that if he, I think he felt that if he went to Ephesus, he'd spend way too much time there because he loves the people in Ephesus. He lived there for three years, so it would probably be difficult for him to get away, okay? And you know, Pentecost is one of the three great feasts of the Jews. And, this, and actually, this would be a perfect time for Paul to, take, to deliver this large amount of money, the, fu the funds that he had, for, that he was going to give to the Jewish Christian leaders. And their gift came from the Gentile believers in Christ from from Asia and from and from Greece, didn't it? So this is this would be a great this would give the mac, maximum publicity and of the Gentiles' gift to the Christians. Okay, so I think that's another reason why he's doing it. All right, let's look at Acts twenty verse seventeen. 
from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Yeah, okay, now here we got, here Paul must have had a, a several day layover in Miletus. Because if you remember, every, every island they went to, they either left the same day or they went the next day. Okay, it was not, it was not, it, there was really no layover. In, in the, on, the, on the islands. But here they must have had a layover because he's sending, for, he's sending for them to come to him. And it would take at least a day because it's about 30 miles over to Ephesus. And then they'd have to get, come back another day. So that might take, so we're talking about two or three days there and it might've taken more. I don't know. I don't know if Paul's gonna catch another ship or whether or not he had a long layover in Miletus. Being back on the mainland, I would think they probably, that's why they had a longer layover, but we really don't know. And another thing it tells us here is the church in Miletus had multiple elders because he said he called to him the elders of the church. So all the, he's calling the elders of the church so they can come talk. And when the elders come to Miletus, actually the next four verses that we're going to read the next four verses are written, it's, it's one sentence that Paul made. Paul had some really long sentences in Scripture, and this is, this is one sentence, but fortunately for us, we break it up into what's understandable for us. So let's do the next two, verse um, 18 and 19. Brian? And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. Yeah, he says, he says you yourselves know. He's telling them. Paul is appear, appealing to their own personal experience. He's pointing to his integrity while he was with them. Paul was true to his ideals. He was true to the message that had been given to him. He was true to the ministry of Jesus Christ. He was honest and fear, and he was honest and fearless in proclaiming it. You know, synonyms for integrity include what? Honesty, honor, character, character, dignity. I'm sure there's so many others, but you can see what he's trying to promote. I, I love a working definition of integrity, which you probably heard before: is integrity is doing the right thing even when no one's looking. And I think we all need to remember that too. Because that's where our integrity really comes in play is when we're being, when we're being honor, honorable and um, when, when no one's looking. And Paul was a man of integrity. And he's calling upon the Ephesian elders as well as all of us, all believers, to be men and women of integrity. And he says in this verse, he also says he goes on, mm -hmm. he goes on serving the Lord. Now, this is how Paul lived serving the Lord, serving God. He calls himself a servant, but the Greek word here um, that Luke uses, and I believe it's, I'm sure it's a quote from Paul, is dulio or doulos. He's a servant, which, which actually conveys the idea of ownership. It conveys the idea of willing service, not forced service. And this person is indeed a slave, a servant, a slave, but it's a slave by choice. It's a bond servant. Exactly. And that's what I'm getting to. It's a bond servant. Paul is willfully making himself a slave to Jesus Christ to do his will. He's a bond servant of Christ. And being a bond servant of Christ is not drudgery because Jesus even said his burden, his his burden is light. Okay? But he is a bond servant. This is a, a bond servant, one who chooses to stay a slave of his master for life. Okay? And Paul uses, actually uses this word bondservant. He calls himself a bondservant 17 times in his epistles. And so I think he tells us to be, imitate him. We need to be a bondservant of Christ too. Well, Paul says that he serves the Lord with all humility. What's humility? Selflessness. Selflessness, absolutely, yeah. I mean, humility at first is a feeling toward God that he has absolute rights over your life, doesn't it? If we've decided to become a bondservant of Christ, then he has absolute rights over our life and that he can do with us whatever he pleases, that he knows what's best for me, that he knows what's best for you. And we need to see ourselves 
as clay in the potter's hands. You've, you've heard that term many times, that let, to let God mold us in the shape that he wants us, not mold ourselves. And humility also a lot, involves a, a conscious awareness of our utter dependency on Jesus, the Messiah, on Jesus Christ. Paul said it well to the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Who's got that? Got that. Not that we are adequate in ourselves, but to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Yeah, when you look at what he says there, not that we're adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, anything, but our adequacy comes from God. I mean, that, I mean, that just speaks to me. A humble person must continually be, be aware that he or she, that, that all that we are stems from God's grace. And this is what Paul is trying to communicate to the Ephesian elders. Paul also tells the elders that he serves the Lord with tears. What do you think that means, serving the Lord with tears? I think it could mean two things. Okay. Okay. I think it could mean times are hard and he was grieving, but I also think it could be tears of joy because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it absolutely can go both ways. I mean, I think Paul is telling them that he gets so intensely involved in people's lives and their struggles that he feels their pain, but he also feels their joy. It spoke to me because sometimes we think of Paul as not being quite human. We do. You know, and I thought, hey, you you know, he's sort of like we are. <laughs> and I see that's what this is. See, that's what this is so good. He's actually showing how human he is, you know. And yet, he is an amazing, God used him in amazing ways. Guess what? God can use us in amazing ways, too. We just have to make ourselves available, right? So, yeah, he feels the people's pain. He feels their joys. He hurts with them. He cries with them. But he also cries, thank you, Vana. He also cries for joy with them, absolutely. <laughs> Just like the, 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 the boy who came back to life, right? All right, let's read verse 20. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. Yeah, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that is profitable. Okay, now shrink is the Greek word hupostello. Hupostello means to withhold under, to cower, to shrink, to conceal. Okay? Paul's telling them that he has not kept silent about anything. He has not kept anything from them. You know, some things that are profitable are a lot of times difficult to receive, aren't they? And sometimes they're very difficult to teach. But Paul held nothing back. Paul could have been seeking to please them and dodged those truths that, he ne that needed to come out. But because he sought to please God, and because he knew these truths to be profitable for their spiritual growth, he plainly taught what God wanted him to teach. And that's what he's saying there. You know, he, he actually, he told it, he, he told it to the Galatian people. It's really interesting how he put it to the Galatian people. See, let's show, show it what he says in Galatians 4.16. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Yeah, so I become, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? I mean... Think about that. Enemy is the Greek word ekthros, and, and ekthros means the object of your hostility, your adversary. Have I become your adversary by telling you what you need to know? You know, and that's, the, I mean, some people don't agree with what we believe when it comes to Scripture, do they? Um, we see it as truth. Others do not. But he's asking them if he's become their enemy because I have, he has told you the truth. I mean, the gospel that he's telling them was not necessarily what they had been raised on, is it? But then it wasn't necessarily what we'd been raised on until we came to Christ. I think um, the sermon today was that kind of a sermon. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. <laughs> Sean was right on, right on point today, yep. He, he and I agree sometimes when it comes, we, we hit right on point, yeah, with that. Well, Paul had the integrity to speak God's truth in love for them. And Paul here in Acts is telling the Ephesian elders to not shrink back from speaking those truths, okay? He, he, he's showing them how the wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles is broken down in Jesus. And that's something they had never seen. 
No one had ever seen this wall of separation broken down because there was a definite, there was a definite barrier between Gentile and Jew, wasn't there? For all time, pretty much. And now it's being broken down. And a slave of Christ doesn't decide what to teach by what's popular or by what's, accept, what's easily accepted. And what we're going to see in verse 27 is that Paul also says that he did not shrink from declaring the whole purpose of God. And we'll get to that. But when you combine not shrinking from declaring the whole purpose of God with the fact that he did not shrink from declaring anything that was profitable, we can see that Paul believed that the whole purpose of God, the whole word of God, is profitable. And of course, we know Paul wrote this to Timothy in his, in his first letter to Timothy. Let's read 1 Timothy three sixteen and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Yeah, I mean, that's so well said. This is, this is a scripture everyone should memorize. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness so that everyone should be taught and, so that, and, and should be taught to everyone so that they might be trained, they might be adequate, and they might be equipped for every good work that they need to do. That's why, folks, that's why I'm committed to teaching scripture verse by verse, um, word by word. So that you, it helps you and me to understand what God is saying through his word, okay? And I think that's what Paul's saying too. He's saying, teach it all. Don't, sh don't shrink back. All right, let's look at Act, Acts 20, verse 21. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, he, here Paul tells us, that he preached to the Jews repentance towards God, which I think means their need to change their mind about who this Jesus is, who this man Jesus is. I mean, for all of us, we need to change our mind about who this man Jesus is. He's God's son, come in the flesh. He's the, he's the long-awaited Messiah. But he also said to the Gentiles, he preached faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Gentiles were not looking for the Messiah, were they? So Paul is teaching them that God sent his son to die on the cross for sin and that the forgiveness of sins is the self, is, and salvation is offered by God through the merits of Christ's atoning sacrifice. Yeah, Tom. Well, this emphasizes a little bit. It says, one, I have one message for Jews and Greeks alike. Same well, no, yeah, he's Tom. He's definitely preaching the same message to both. But I kind of, I kind of see it as he's preaching to one because they they need to see who Jesus really is. Everybody needs to see who Jesus. Is. So it's pretty much he's preaching. He's preaching to both of them alike. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Same message for different absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. You know, I think I think the Holy Spirit was definitely leading Paul. But he also had the knowledge of the Old Testament. He did. You remember Joshua when he said, where Joshua 1 9, where he said, Do not be afraid, you know, do exactly what I say. And That's right. Everything will turn out okay. I mean, basically, paraphrased, he knew that. Well, well, don't we know Paul to be a Pharisee of Pharisees? I mean, you know, so when we look at that, if he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, he knew the Old Testament. He knew most of it, if not all of it, by heart. You know, exactly. I can't imagine memorizing it, but they did. Plus the Holy Spirit. He had that scripture Absolutely. Memorized. That's right. Absolutely. All right. Let's see. Let's see if we have time. Let's read Acts 20, verse 20 through 20, 20 and 20, 22 and 23. Who's got that? Me. And now behold, bound, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Yeah, I mean, apparently Paul had received prophecy telling him about danger already. That might have been why he was walking to Asos. We don't know. You know, he's communicating with God. God's letting him know what's going to happen. But he's not dissuaded by danger. He's willing to lay down his life for the gospel. Paul is fearless because he's bound by God's Holy Spirit. And he knows that the Holy Spirit's going to be his guide and help 
wherever he goes. And see, he says, knowing not what will happen to me, except that the Holy Spirit will testify to me. And guess what, guys? He will for us too. If, if, we, are, if we are pushed to stay away from something, that very well, it might be the Holy Spirit telling us that you're getting yourself into trouble, okay? And I don't know your situation. You don't know mine. But it's one of those things we want to be sure to be in co communication with the Holy Spirit on, for sure. And uh, he remembered David and Goliath. Absolutely, you know, yeah. He was facing Goliath. He was mm -hmm. David, basically. But God was big enough. That's right. God is big enough. That's right. All right, if you read verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Yeah, I mean, Paul's ministry, I mean, Paul's ministry was costly to him. We know that. I mean, he knows facing danger. He knows, he knows that he's facing danger, trials, um, hardship, and affliction. You know, everywhere he goes, the Holy Spirit is witnessing to him. And, he's, and, and he, everywhere he goes, he's witnessing to him through his third circumstances. He's witnessing to him through other believers that he was headed for trouble, and he knew it. He knew he was headed for trouble, Okay. Um, but he was committed to see everything through, to see through and finish his course rather than, rather than preserve his life at all costs. He chooses to pursue the purpose that Jesus Christ has for him to testify to the, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's read verse 25. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Yeah, Paul here. That's the sense in his heart that he's not going to ever be back to Ephesus, okay? He knows that persecution faces him. For, he knows the Jews are probably going to do something, and something awaits him in Jerusalem. He just doesn't know. But he also knows that he plans to go on to Rome, doesn't he? And from Rome, he's planning to go to Spain, all right? So he doesn't see himself ever coming back to Ephesus. How so, old was he here? How old? I don't even know how old he was, but this is probably about 57, A.D., so he was... I was thinking maybe the age also. Could have been the age. I don't know. Yeah, he, did, he didn't have any... Have any and I don't think he knew... Uh, he obviously didn't know how many years he had left, but, you know, he just knows he's not coming back. Yep. All right, so this is his farewell address. Let's read the next two verses, and we'll finish up real quickly. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Yeah, he, he, there's that. I did not shrink from declaring the whole purpose of God. Paul And Paul is saying here that he is innocent of the blood of all men. He's basically telling them that he has fulfilled his duties. He has warned them through his life. He's warned them through his, uh, through his preaching, okay? That he didn't, and he didn't shrink from declaring the whole purpose of God. During his three years in Ephesus, he stayed there, he taught every day for five hours, and he taught the whole purpose of God. And that's what he's trying to get these Ephesian elders to understand. This is what you need to do, continue to do. He wasn't afraid of anything because Paul is a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He's a slave by choice to Jesus. And Paul is going to teach, and he's going to let the chips fall where they would. And I think that's what Paul was, and he's, he's communicating to the Ephesian elders. And we will continue that next time because he, we got a lot more that he's still speaking to the Ephesian elders about. Any thoughts or questions? All right, let's pray.